Please pray with me. Almighty Father in heaven, you are our loving, merciful God. You have taught us the way in your holy word and of your commandments, and so we beg of you now that you would pour out your grace into our own hearts. Cause your grace to bear fruit in us, that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed toward your will and daily increase in our love toward you and our love toward each other. Help us resist all evil and help us to live godly lives in your name. Help us, Lord, to follow the example of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace to you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the benefits of living in Florida, and especially South Florida, is the opportunity that we have to frequently go to the amusement parks that are there in Central Florida especially. And now you know, like I know, we're benefited by the reality that we can get the Florida Pass, right? And so our children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces tend to be a little bit more familiar with the parks. And as they go, and as they become more familiar, they really have a lay of the land and they think they own the place all the time. Well, one of our favorite places to go years earlier used to be the SeaWorld. If you've ever been to the SeaWorld, you know that they have spruced it up a bit and they have put a lot of uh, fun, eventful kinds of things that children can get involved with, not just looking at the sea creatures and all the other animals there, but also the, the climbing net ropes and all of the other jungle kinds of things that they can involve themselves in and the, the touching zone where they can actually touch the stingray in the uh, big uh, stingray tank. Well, our children love SeaWorld, and my wife and I love SeaWorld as well. And one of the occasions that we attended some five years ago was a memorable one for us. It was such that, as you know, uh, get a little bit hungry. The kids are making their way, enjoying the whole park and enjoying what we're doing. It's coming around lunchtime. And so we look and say, well, you know, it's nice that they have seen these people in these amusement parks, these theme parks, the needs of parents, and they provide these wonderful family bathrooms. Not just men and women, but family bathrooms. You know, it's kind of nice. Go in there and set up and do whatever you need to do. Well, it was getting close to lunchtime, and, and Ginger said to me, well, I'm going to take Thomas first, and we're going to go there to the family restroom, and then we'll come on back out. And so I said, fine, and she went, and I took Nina and James, and Daniel Mark was only a year old at that time in the stroller still, and uh, they're kind of looking around, and Ginger comes out, and we turn around and say, okay, what do you want to do next? Well, why don't we go get lunch? Okay, well, we'll go and get lunch. And after lunch, they can climb up on the, the rope thing there. You know, that looks like a, a lot of fun. Uh, and, and I looked at Ginger, and I asked her, where's Thomas? And she said, you have him. And I said, no, honey, you just went to the bathroom with him. <laughs> and she looked down, and I looked down. We looked north, south, east, and west. No Thomas. We could not find him. And suddenly, our great euphoria about having lunch was over, and we went into panic mode. We were searching all over, and it was not funny anymore after a minute and a half when we could not find him. We we're looking everywhere, and suddenly, every child in SeaWorld had auburn-colored hair. And every <laughs> child in SeaWorld seemed to be wearing the same color clothes. We pulled out the security photograph that we had received at the school that identifies his height and his weight, and we're running around like idiots looking for security, and within three minutes, we found a security guard, and uh, immediately, these parks are fabulous, immediately they had radioed and shut down all the entrances and exits and all the places in, and the security guard says, already now, we are looking at all the cameras to see if we can spot where he went. But that did not give us comfort and peace because our son was lost. We did not know where he was. It was no comfort to know that the rest of all of security was looking for him and we were looking for him. We did not know where our son was. Ten minutes seemed like ten years. And finally, one of the security guards who stayed with us heard on the radio, we found him. One of the security guards was up at the top of the nets, the climbing jungle rope gym thing. 
And Thomas, only when he got stuck, began to look around and see who would help him. And there was a very large security officer there who was saying, boy, come with me. <laughs> and so he brought Thomas down, and Thomas had a big smile on his face. And he was talking about climbing up on the rope thing and did not even notice the tears streaming down the face of his parents. Now tears of joy because our son who was lost is now found. Now, in a small way, that remembrance helps me appreciate a bit the joy and the relief of the man that Jesus spoke about in the parable that he gave to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and to the disciples gathered there. When he was talking about the kingdom of God, he began to talk to them in parables so they would understand clearly the message of God and to understand what the father of that prodigal son felt like in the message we heard today from Luke chapter 15. He had lost his son, but he had lost his son under far different circumstances. This son, this prodigal son of the father, actually came up to the father and demanded his share of the inheritance, which is the exact same thing as wishing that his father was dead, but saying it right to his face. Give me what's mine. Divide it up. You're as good as dead, you geezer. And so what did the son do? His father divided up the inheritance to both sons. The son sold it all, and then he left. He didn't tell his father where he was going. He just left. And the father probably wondered at that very moment, will I ever see my son again? No matter how bad their relationship evidently was, the father was sick, heartbroken. Heartbroken. And so it seems every day, according to the text of Scripture, as we read this account in the Synoptic Gospels, that this father was looking every day for his son. Every day he would look out his window, look past everything in the beautiful village, look far down the road for his son. Nothing else now in life really mattered. Only one thought. Would this be the day? Would today be the day? Until one day it happened. One day it happened. There was his son. There he was, coming down the road. And at that moment, seeing his son, nothing else mattered to the father. He runs down the stairs out of his house. He runs through the roads of the village. And he grabs hold of his son. He hugs him and he kisses him. And there are tears of joy pouring down his face as he embraces his son. His son who was lost and now who was found. He didn't care about the inheritance. He didn't care about the wasted money. He didn't care about the insults that he received face to face with this disrespectful boy. Nothing else mattered to him. Only that he found his son again. He was dead and now he is alive. And now he doesn't even care that the rest of the villagers in the town see him with his robes hiked up, his legs showing, as he's running through the village to hug his son, which would be considered a great dishonor and a shameful thing for the master of the house to do. He doesn't care that the rest of the village thinks that his son is a really ne'er-do-well, no good, and doesn't deserve this welcome home from the father. He doesn't care. He doesn't even care about the fact that his son wasted the entire inheritance and comes now back to him barefoot in rags. In a small way, it was like that for me at SeaWorld. I did not care what other people thought of me as I frantically pushed through the crowd, pointing out the picture. This is my son. Have you seen him? I didn't care. I didn't care that people thought that I was a terrible dad for losing my son. All I cared about was finding Thomas. I didn't care. The only thing that mattered was the joy of finding my son who was lost. 
And that, my friends, is the picture of your Savior. God and Jesus Christ come to you. Come to you to find his sons and his daughters. God in Jesus Christ reconciling us and not counting our sins against us. God in Jesus Christ coming to us seeking to save the lost. For while we were yet sinners, Christ came for us, the Scriptures declare. While we were still a long way off, God came from heaven to find us, to rescue us, and to give Himself for us. He allows Himself to be publicly shamed. He allows Himself to be mistreated, insults hurled at Him, and to be hung on the cross as a criminal. Costly love. But He doesn't care. He can't not do this. And He does not hide His love. No, the Father running through the village, He wants everyone there to see it. He wants everyone to know. And he wants everyone to know that when he finds his son, it's time to celebrate. But not alone. The father in the parable that Jesus gives throws a great banquet feast. Jesus celebrates with all of us he finds. Jesus celebrates with the angels. The angels of God that the Scriptures declare to us, the angels of God in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. And it can be no other way. Such is the love of your heavenly Father for you. His love for you. And He accepts us back only on His terms. Did you notice that? Did you notice that in the parable, when we read the parable, maybe it's so familiar that we skip over it. But the prodigal son thinks that he's got it figured out. The boy thinks he's figured it all out. After he's wasted all of his inheritance, he thinks he's now going to fix it. He's going to now fix the problem by getting a job. And when that doesn't work out, and he runs out of other options, he decides to go back to his father. But now he goes back to his father with his own plan. He's going to make up for what he did. He wants to restore the family name. And he wants to restore the family honor. And so he decides to go back on his terms. And he decides to go back and ask his father to take him back, to give him a job as one of the hired servants. That way, he can earn his living and at the same time, save up some of the money there to settle the accounts with his father and pay him back. And so he goes back with that plan in mind. He will make himself worthy. And so many times, that is exactly what we think. It's what we think. That somehow we will make ourselves worthy of God's forgiveness. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to repent more. I'm going to rededicate myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I will. I'm going to. I will. I will. I will. But you can't fix a broken heart like a broken window. A new sheet of glass and the broken window is something of the past. Not so with a broken heart. And so the Father doesn't accept us back on our terms or according to our plan as if we can fix or solve the problem of our sin and the sin that we've caused that has messed everything up. To think that only cheapens the reality of the pain that we have caused with our sin. No. No, the Father only accepts us, only accepts us on His terms. But what then? But what then are his terms? Simply this, that we receive his unconditional love and forgiveness and that we accept being found. 
That we stop trying to make ourselves worthy and receive our Father's love for us because we're worthy to receive it. That's what happened in the parable. The Father takes the action first. The Father throws his arms around his Son. He embraces him. He hugs him. He kisses him. He demonstrates his love. And the Father shows his love and his joy and his forgiveness to his Son. And in response, the Son will never be the same. He's changed. He no longer believes that he can offer to make amends, to make himself worthy. He sees the problem now. The problem now is not with the lost inheritance. The problem now is not the money. It's with the father's broken heart. And no amount of effort on his part can fix that. He can only receive his father's love and accept being found. He is humbled in the face of such overwhelming love and grace. And when the Father sees that his love and grace has been received, the celebration begins. He orders his son be restored. He doesn't want anyone to see his boy in rags. He wants to see his son with a beautiful new robe with beautiful new shoes and a golden ring placed upon upon his finger. Killing the fattened calf would feed over 200 people. Such is the joy of the father. He wants everyone, everyone in the town to celebrate with him. His son who was lost is now found. And so Jesus goes and he eats with the tax collectors, with the prostitutes, with the sinners. Sinners! He rejoices in finding them. He has to rejoice. That's why he came from heaven, to find and embrace his lost sons and his lost daughters and overwhelm them with his love. And when they repent and they receive his love and his forgiveness, he celebrates. But because of this very fact, this foolish love, this foolish self-sacrifice, This foolishness of the cross, as the Scriptures declares it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they that know the Scriptures, begin to harumph. They begin to grumble, complain. They are the older brothers, grumbling at the Father's love, grumbling at the celebration. But note in the Scriptures that the Father does not get angry with the older son but he wants him to understand that his love and his grace is for him too. For notice that the older son has the same problem that the younger son did, thinking of his relationship with his father in terms of service, in terms of work, in terms of worthiness. What's his complaint to his father when he sees the celebration for his brother? He tells his father, look, look! All these many years I have served you. I've worked for you. But the father will not accept such talk. The father will not accept this. He will not accept his younger son or his older son on the basis of their service, on the basis of their work, or on the basis of what they think is their worthiness. No, no, they are his sons. They're his sons. They will always be his sons. And he only wants them to receive his love and to celebrate his love. And so it is for you and for me. Now you may consider yourself a prodigal son. Maybe you have sinned greatly in your life. Maybe you've wasted way too much time. Maybe you've thought yourself to be unworthy, and now you're wanting to make yourself worthy of God's love again. Or you may consider yourself to be the older son, having been in the church your whole life, having been there week in and week out, done all the dutiful things that a good servant in the church does believing yourself to be worthy of God's love for having served God so faithfully. 
but your heavenly Father will have nothing to do with this talk. He does not love or forgive or accept you on the basis of anything you have done or any of the promises that you make today or promises that you want to keep in the future. He simply wants to overwhelm you with his own love. That in repentance, you give up everything you think you can do for him and simply receive his love and his grace and his forgiveness and that you accept being found. And that's the focus of the season of Lent. That we understand clearly what Jesus is saying not only to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the disciples gathered there, but to us today. That God in Jesus Christ came for us. That he left his throne in heaven to come for you. For you. That he loves you with an everlasting love. That he gave up everything for you even to the shame of hanging on the cross. Not because you're worthy, because you are not. And not so that you would become his slave or become his servant, but he came to find his sons and his daughters who were lost. And he's found you. And he's found you. And there is nothing that you can do to make yourself worthy. He asks only that in repentance you receive his love and forgiveness and that you come and you eat at his banqueting table. Feast upon him, the son of the living God who has come for you. For you were dead. You were dead. And now you're alive. You were lost. But now you're found. Amen. Heavenly Father, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you brought us home. Dying and living, Jesus declared your love, gave us your grace, and opened for us the gate of glory. Amen. Please stand and let us confess and celebrate.